topic. I'm going to discuss, discuss tonight lends itself to sensationalism and has been subjected to a lot of it. One reason for that is that until about 20 years ago, we really didn't know much about what German corporations and banks had done during the Nazi period, let alone about why. So a lot of room existed for suspicion, supposition, and innuendo. Yes, the United States had put a number of prominent corporate figures on trial after World War II. Notably, two directors of the Dresdner Bank, 23 chief executives of the large project of the John and Chemicals Company, and several leaders of the Krupp, Armaments, Coal, and Steel firm. But the prosecutions weren't very effective largely because the American lawyers acted like they were pursuing antitrust cases rather than human rights ones. And the issues the trials presented rapidly got caught up in. Rapidly got caught up in. And the issues the trials presented that that were and the issues the trials presented rapidly got caught up in and obscured by the Cold War confrontation between capitalism and communism. By 1951, even the rather small number of convicted corporate executives had gone free, virtually the only ones who paid with their lives for complicity in the Holocaust were two senior managers of the firm that sold the Zeitlon to the SS, which was used to gas people. The British executed both men. Thereafter, the records that might have told us what happened and why remained largely closed. Most firms locked the doors of their archives or claimed that these had been bombed out and turned their efforts to creating a mythology of how business suffered under the dictates of a terroristic and totalitarian Nazi state. This is the way matters remained for decades long enough for the next generation of leaders of German industry to believe the stories their elders told them. The 1990s changed all this and exposed an enormous documentary record to researchers. How? Basically, through the interaction of the process of globalization with an innovation in American law, the class action suit. Globalization meant that many German corporations that had been involved with crimes in the Third Reich later acquired American operations or subsidiaries and wanted a good reputation in U.S. markets. The legal change meant that classes of people who felt wronged by corporate conduct during the Nazi era could gather together to sue those German entities in American courts for the recovery of ill-gotten gains from the assets of the US operations for subsidiaries. As these suits multiplied in the late 1990s, the German parties adopted, largely as a PR strategy, the practice of asking prominent historians to examine their long-concealed records and write reports on what they contained. A flurry of corporate histories resulted. Books appeared about BMW, Volkswagen and Daimler Benz, the maker of Mercedes, the fashion house Hugo Boss, the construction firms Holtzman and Holtke, the publisher Bertelsmann, the successor firms to IG Farben, BASF, Bayer, and Hux, the Deutsche and Dresdner banks, and Krupp. One of my own books was part of this wave of publication, the one on De Gusa, the German Gold and Silver, Silver Separation Institute the firm that held the patents on Zeitlon, the gas used at Auschwitz, and that turned the precious metals stolen from Jews, including from the mouths of their corpses, into usable assets for the Third Reich. Indeed, so many of these books have appeared that they now take up 15 feet of shelf space in my library at home. The outpouring of research provides remarkable insight into the degree to which everyday Germans became complicit in the crimes of the Nazi state. And the very recognizable, and perhaps to us familiar reasons why. A story that usually had been told simply as a matter of hatred and greed, 
of anti-Semitism and profit-seeking. Turns out to be somewhat more complicated than that. In fact, when one looks closely at the internal records of German firms, one finds something rather astounding. Among corporate executives, anti-Semitism functioned less as a motive from the beginning than as a rationalization as the Holocaust escalated. The ruthless corporate behavior of 1943 was not predictable from the starting situation in 1933. German corporations did not play a very prominent or active role in bringing Adolf Hitler to power. And most corporate executives mistrusted him and his economic ideas at the outset. Although some of them thought Jews had acquired too much influence in German life, especially in German cultural life, they certainly did not generally believe, as the Nazis did, that the Jews were at the root of the nation's problems. Big business leaders did share some overlapping interests with the Nazi party, above all a desire to rein in the trade unions and to restore German national pride. But that was about it. But once Hitler acquired power, the nation's business leaders fell in line, concluding that discretion was the better part of valor and that more was to be gained by going along and by raising objections. This meant, almost from the beginning of Nazi rule, throwing their Jewish colleagues to the wolves. Of course, instances of bigotry, strengthened by envy and greed, showed up in some of the narratives of the expulsion of Jews from high-ranking business positions and in the takeovers of Jewish-owned companies. The desire for a colleague's corner office led some Gentile managers to lead the charge to drive out Jewish colleagues in the first stage of the process that the Nazis called Aryanization. But businesses had countervailing interests, too. The big German banks, in particular, worried that client firms taken over from Jews by inexperienced new owners might lead to defaults on loans and other losses for the banks. Generally, however, <clears throat> the language of self-interest and self-defense sufficed to make corporate managers turn on their Jewish counterparts. The aggressors usually dressed up their actions in the language of duty. One had to do certain things, as the phrase at the time went, quote, under the prevailing conditions for the good of the firm, unquote. A powerful illustration of how this worked is the story of Charles Rosenthal, and the company he headed in early 1933, the Philip Holtzmann AG, AG is the German abbreviation for Incorporated, the nation's largest construction and road building firm. In the spring of 1933, Fritz Todt, a Nazi who was responsible for the building of the Alamans, the superhighways, called in the man, Philip Holtzmann, after whom the company was named, and said to Holtzmann, that he and his firm would not be allowed to bid on government contracts for the building of the autobahns or even for the repairing of potholes in German streets, which was about to start in the spring of 1933, unless they dismissed the Jew at the head of the company. Charles Rosenthal had been appointed by Philip Holtzmann. They were close friends. And <clears throat> he was now being told, Holtzmann was now being told, that the government would not allow any big government business to go to the company as long as Rosenthal remained. Philip Holtzman went to Charles Rosenthal, told him the story, and at that point Rosenthal said, I will resign the board of the firm. And Holtzman said, I will find you a position with the firm abroad, which he probably did. Holtzman uh, sent Rosenthal to Bolivia to work on a large construction project, the branch of the Nazi party in Bolivia. Yes, there was some point pounded Rosenthal and broke him out of that job, and he ended his life in this city in 1939, um, penniless and, and professionally ruined. As this example makes clear, <clears throat> the Nazi regime was adept at using a mix of government controls, compulsion, and the exploitation of competition among firms to get the behavior that the right wanted. 
I've gone so far as to call this a Skinner box economy, one in which the government used a mix of rewards and punishments, much like the psychologist B.F. Skinner used food pellets and shocks to condition pigeons to respond to stimuli as he wanted. The devices available to the government ranged from refusing to authorize mergers unless Jews were forced out of firms, to threatening to start up state-owned companies to produce the goods the regime wanted, to restricting access, as in the case of Holzmann, to government contracts, and to hinting that the government could always ask a competitor to do its dirty work and, and reward it accordingly. Only a little pressure of this sort and a few examples of making good on it sufficed to make most firms start exercising what in German is called Vorhaus Islander Gehorsam, anticipatory obedience. Despite all this, considerable room to maneuver in dealing with the regime's persecuting policies existed, at least in certain times, and provided the firm and the executives involved exercised some imagination. In my research, I've discovered three striking illustrations of how German corporate executives could improve the lot of Jews, even in the Nazi context, or in this case, in one of these stories, the lot of someone who is suspected of being a Jew. The first is a story from the history of IG Farming. A man named Fritz Dajewski was the chief executive of a plant at Wolfen, not far from Berlin, which made um, photographic film. The Agfa operation was based at Wolfen. In the spring of 1933, the Nazi Party Union, an organization called the NSBO, came to send its representatives to Kajewski to demand the dismissal of the Jewish managers in the plan, one of whom was a man named Korshman. Korshman was suspected of being a Jew, although he discovered from post-war research that he had a Jewish great-grandfather. That was it. Um, and when Kajewski received this request, he said, basically, ich bitte um den Zeit. I need time to think this over. Um, come back and see me in two weeks, and I'll let you know what my decision is. Um, when they came back two weeks later, the representatives of the Nazi party, uh, Gajewski sent out his right-hand man. He didn't even speak to them directly. And he had the right-hand man say to them the following. Listen very closely. National Socialism did not replace democracy in Germany in order to introduce democracy to my factory, unquote. In other words, what he was saying to them is, I am the Führer here. Who works in this company is who I determine works in this company, not who you tell me can work in this company. And he refused not only, not, refused not only to fire Korshmai, who it turned out was not Jewish, but he refused to fire any Jewish executive at the Bolton plant until 1938, when the government introduced regulations that said, you must fire the Jews or we'll take away your allocations of foreign exchange and so on and so forth. Now, this was a sign of some, he, this doesn't mean that he was not an anti-Semite. Fritz Gajewski actually joined the Nazi party in May of 1933. It meant, however, that he saw a personal and a corporate interest in preserving these people as the employees of the company. And when he saw that, he exercised enough imagination to flummox the Nazis who were threatening him. And he bought time out of these people. The second one is, in some ways, an even more remarkable story. This is the story of a man named Hans Busemann. Hans Busemann was the chief executive of Degusa, this company to which we refer. In the 1920s, <clears throat> Degusa bought a series of smaller chemical companies. Several of them, two that I'm going to talk about, were owned by Jewish families. What Degusa did was it bought 74% of the stock in these subsidiaries and left the Jewish family with 26% and left the Jewish former owners in charge of the management of the factories it bought. Okay? Now, in, 19, in the fall of 1937, the National Socialist Union, the NSBO, at one of these factories, a place called uh, the Kedesha Fabrik Grünau, which is not far from Berlin. The NSBO came to the leader of the subsidiary and said, we want to compete for the honor of being a national socialist model factory. 
this is a national prize. People got you get to hang up a big plaque in the front and say you were one of the best factories in the country. There were certain privileges for the workers that flowed from this. Sometimes they could get free vacations in the summer and so on. The problem was that no company could compete for that in which Jews owned more than 25% of the stock. And the family, the Myers in this case, from whom this company had been bought, still owned 26%. And so this manager who received the union, whose, his name was Katzoff, wrote a letter to Guzman, the head of the parent company, and said, what do I do? And Guzman's letter survives in the corporate archives of the which used to be in Frankfurt, are now in Hanau, Hanau, not far away from Frankfurt. And it is quite a remarkable document. Because what Ernst Guzman does, he writes in this document, I have known the Myers ever since we bought that company. They are fine, upstanding people. It pains me to think their fate lies in my hands. And then comes the key sentence. Aber das hat keinen Zweck, gegen den Strom zu schwimmen. But there is no purpose in swimming against the stream. The buyers must go, so forth. And then what does he do? So he's made this decision. He's going to get rid of them in his own self-interest. But then he thinks of a way to do the, what he thinks the best thing he can for that is, which is to overpay them for their stock. And in Germany, stock in those days was always denominated by its face value. So what he did is he gave them stock in IG Farbe, the giant chemical company, with the same face value as their stock, but about 140% of market value. Clearly, he was trying to figure out some way to honor his friends, to do them justice, but also to conform to the political leadership. Um, the third story is also quite remarkable, and this has to do with a man I met. Um, a man who didn't die until, uh, I think, three years ago. He died at the age of 102. His name was Robert Cross. Robert Cross was the manager of a factory at a, a Gusa subsidiary in the town of Gleibitz. I feel like I'm losing this somehow. Yeah. Um, Gleibitz is the town where the Second World War began. It was in uh, 1939, right on the border between Poland and Germany. It's where the Nazis staged an alleged attack by the Poles on a local radio station, and that became the excuse for invading Poland. Uh, in 1941, it was no longer on the border between Poland and Germany because Germany had annexed eastern upper Silesia, which is where Auschwitz is located, and Auschwitz is 20 miles to the southeast of Gleibitz. Um, Robert Cross was appointed to be the manager of this new factory that Gleibitz was going to build, that, that, that Degusa was going to build in Gleibitz. And he is the man who, and we can trace this through the records, he is the man who agreed to use slave laborers to help construct and to operate the factory. And what is remarkable is not so much that he did that, many German industrialists did that, what is so remarkable is what happened to the laborers who worked in this factory. There were 209 women, sent Jewish women, sent from the last ghetto in eastern upper side of Egypt, Sosnovice, who were sent to this plant in um, April of 1943. When they were evacuated, as the Russians were coming over the hill in January of 1945, 207 of them were still alive. Only two of them had died. And we know, because I interview the woman who was the foreman of this group of Jewish women. She lived after the war in Bethesda, Maryland, and she died um, just last year. Um, and I asked her, is this true? It looks like in the records that only two women died under the conditions of slave labor in the German factory. And she said, yes. And she said, not only that, they didn't die from the war. They died because the day the SS took over the factory in 1944, and started guarding the women in lieu of a, a previous guard force. They climbed up to the highest spot on the factory and threw themselves off because they, had, they knew what the SS was like and had experienced the SS before. Now, the same factory used something like a thousand men 
and from an Auschwitz concentration camp, almost all of them Jews, as slave laborers to help construct the site. And over 300 of them died. Now this is a more, in other words, the men were 150 times more likely to die at this site than the women were. How can we account for such a difference? It's not just that the men worked outside and the women worked inside. It's not just the men worked on construction and the women worked mostly on manufacturing. But the women basically, this is a, this is a factory that incidentally made, I had to learn a lot of strange things about chemistry when I was writing this book. This is a factory that made soot. Can you imagine? They made soot. And it turns out there are hundreds of forms of soot. And the one they made is called carbon black. And you actually today observed products made out of carbon black. Carbon black is an essential additive to every rubber tire in the world. It is still made. Degusa has 15% of the world's production like that still. Um, if you add soot to either natural rubber or synthetic rubber, it increases the durability in certain combinations. So that's what they were making. And the women in this factory, what they did is they, they bagged it. They took the soot out of the machines and bagged it. So this was, they were indeed important to the operation of the company in the way the men were not. Because the men were good to the company, valuable to the company, only until the buildings were up. And then who needed them? But the women were of continuing value. Now it seems to me that Pross had an interest in preserving these women. And for all the excuses that German corporate executives had made since 1945, that they couldn't control conditions of slave labor, that they couldn't take care of people, Robert Pross clearly did. And thus, what that tells us is that German corporate executives tended to exercise these sorts of imagination only when relative decency coincided with their own or their firm's interests and only in exceptional cases. But they could, if they had wanted badly enough, have, have done better. Moreover, after the spring of 1938, when the government required the expulsion of Jews from German enterprises and from the economy as a whole, instances of empathy or even alleviation declined in frequency. When self-interest did not encourage decency, the effects of corruption and the inversion of moral values in Nazi Germany became apparent. Remember, this was a country in which prejudice was being praised incessantly as both good and patriotic, indeed as an act of self-defense. Thus, de Gusa, which had tried to help the Meyer family in late 1937, behaved ruthlessly to the Margulis family in an almost identical situation in Austria only a few months later. Two years after that, de Gusa literally advised the Gestapo on how to dispossess a Jewish owner of a metal smelting firm that the German company wanted in the occupied part of Czechoslovakia. Another striking example of, of corruption is the actions of the leaders of the Allianz Insurance Company, the nation's largest after the Kristallnacht pogrom of November 1938. To avoid having to pay out the insured value of smashed windows and other property to either the Jewish policymakers or to the German state, that chief executive argued to Hermann Göring in emphatically Nazi terms that no German enterprise should have to pay the supposed instigators of what had happened that is, the allegedly criminal and disloyal Jews, and that letting the right collect the money instead, as Goering wanted, would lead to a high, higher premium payments for loyal so-called Aryan Germans. As a result, Allianz and other German insurers got out of paying almost 45 million marks in insured damages, and the Nazi state agreed to settle for payments of a mere 1.3 million. These transformations are demonstrations of the, way, of the ways human ingenuity adapted to new contexts for its exercise. They are reminders that power magnifies the ideas of those who hold it, particularly when they silence virtually all competing ideas 
and values in a society. Deference or adherence to these ideas comes to determine whether a person gets ahead or attains goals. Conformity feeds on self-interest. And in terms of the effects on victims, whether or not people actually believe Nazi ideology and embraced anti-Semitism virtually ceased to matter. What mattered is that people behaved in accordance with the ideology. And that was enough to crush the livelihoods and then the lives of the Jews in Target. During the war years, the dehumanization of the victims of the Holocaust in the eyes of corporate executives became most massively apparent in the slave labor system. Now, people were treated as mere means to ends, as factors of production, like a raw material, not as human beings. But here, too, the story is more complicated and more alarming than the usual narrative indicates. Usually observers talk about slave labor, the slave labor system, as a profit-maximizing enterprise, one in which the attraction to companies was that the, lab the laborers were cheap. This is largely wrong. The attraction was not cost, because the SS imposed high charges for the concentration camp inmates that composed the slave labor force. And the housing and other costs of the other foreigners who made up the forced labor population were also often higher than the value of their output. The attraction of the use of compulsory workers was their availability, not their price. In Germany in the Second World War, 11 million men were called up to the army, taken out of the workforce. In Germany in 1939, a larger share of women of working age were already in the workforce than was ever the case in Britain and the United States during the Second World War. Okay? Can I say that carefully enough? In other words, we think of Rosie the River, but Helga was there first. And there were more of them, and they were there by 1939. And after 1939, wartime demand for armaments and the like burgeoned. In other words, the German labor supply was inelastic. We couldn't get more women into the workforce, and men were being drawn out of it. And the demand for what they made was increasing all the time. The only solutions available to Germans, Germany's war planners were either to export production to occupied countries or to import workers from these places. The regime primarily chose the latter course. And business largely agreed in order to prevent foreign firms from learning trade secrets and to, and to keep up with production goals as best they could. In other words, the shortage of labor interacted with corporate self-protection in such a way that firms felt compelled to take forced and slave laborers. With regard to slave labor, as with regard to the so-called Aryanization of enterprises formerly owned by Jews, and even with regard to the sale of Zyklon B, or Degussa's refining of precious metals stolen from Jews, the role of monetary calculations was more complicated than you might think. The immediate returns were often scant, because the Nazi government made sure of that. It held profit margins down on the Zyklon, demanded special prices for the metals refined, used the shortage of labor to jack up the price of camping and taxed away anything that the right regarded as an excess profit on the company table. Total proceeds on the sale of Zyklon to Auschwitz over four years were $168,000 in today's US dollars. Only about one-fourth of the substance was used to kill people, and the profits were divided among three co-owners of the patent. In short, the booty was limited. Let me put the matter in a more shocking way. The cost to the SS of the poison gas used at Auschwitz came to about one US cent per corpse at the time. Obviously, the profit was even less. The companies that nonetheless took advantage of the persecution of Jews were usually playing for long-term gains, not short ones. And these were often more political 
and strictly economic. Meanwhile, they sought to achieve prosaic commercial goals and justified their actions with reference to these goals. The executives involved had a broad repertoire of ways of normalizing the atrocities they participated in. They told themselves that they were vindicating the worth and power of private enterprise against the Nazi claim that capitalist selfishness often stood in the way of national goals. They told themselves that they were pursuing long-standing commercial strategies in a favorable context. In I.G. Farben's case, they were perfecting a new synthetic chemical product, rubber from coal, which is what the firm planned to make at Auschwitz. In De Gusa's case, the manager said they were carrying out a pre-existing diversification drive, which is what made buying up available Jewish-owned companies so attractive. Or these executives said that they were preventing the loss of business or know-how to foreign competitors. When Bayer, the makers of aspirin, asked for forced laborers, it was trying to stop the transfer of aspirin production to France. When De Gusa agreed to build the new carbon black factory in Gleibitz, with inmates from the ghettos there. One objective was to make sure a competing plant did not go up in Hungary. Or the executives claimed to be reinforcing a potentially lucrative political alliance. At Auschwitz, IG Farben's managers knew that they could build their new factory faster with free than with slave laborers, but they continued to pay the SS for camp inmates because the managers expected the SS to reward them later. Or finally, these executives told themselves that they were preventing shutdowns or loss of equipment. Toward the end of the war, the directors of Daimler Benz knew that it was lost, but they kept begging for slave laborers to help them transfer machinery and other assets underground. Why? So the material would survive the war and provide the basis for renewed production later. Ironically and worryingly, some of these long-term arguments paid off. De Cusa was three to four times richer in 1949 than it had been in 1925. And most of the gains came from meeting the armaments needs of the Nazi regime, and from keeping the Jewish, formerly Jewish-owned properties that De Cusa had acquired. The story with regard to slave labor is more ambiguous, however because most of the plants constructed by it were in the far eastern portions of Germany, mostly Silesia, and they either were still unfinished when the Russians arrived in 1945, or they were taken over by Poland afterwards. Whatever the long-term outcome, the rationalizations that I've listed insulated the managers prior to 1945 from the full force of what they were doing. Still, the justifications often weren't enough, especially for those executives who saw the condition of the slave laborers they exploited. For them, something else was necessary, and they often resorted to the rationale that the regime provided, anti-Semitism. What happened in the upper ranks of German industry was not, I think, as Shaw Friedlander claims, the spread before Hitler came to power of an ideology of redemptive anti-Semitism, that is, the idea that the removal of the Jews was the solution to all Germany's problems. But that ideology certainly did spread once Hitler was in office. Germans in all walks of life fled into it, not only as a vehicle of their own advantage, but also as the most powerful legitimation of what they were doing to Jews. Anti-Semitism became pervasive after 1933 in this fashion, especially in the German corporate world. What this story shows, I believe, is the corruptibility of people by self-interest, weakness, fear, restricted senses of obligation and responsibility, self-pity, that is, concentration on the pains of persecuted rather than being persecuted, patriotism, identity, and the attraction of what are called the secondary virtues, above all, a sense of duty and professionalism. All of these impulses helped numb many Germans to the suffering they inflicted. These are timeless, 
universal forces. They highlight the ability of governments that rule by terror and indoctrination to transform traditional, sometimes apparently admirable values into brutal ones. The process could have been deflected then, as now, only by united action in defense of firmly held and widely accepted countervailing values, such as the worth and sanctity of all individual life, the moral and practical superiority of democracy to authoritarianism, and the priority of means over ends. Just stopping for a moment to reflect on how difficult these defenses are to build and maintain is enough to make us understand how easily even a sophisticated society can descend into barbarism when the levers of power and the reward structures push in that direction. <coughs> I'm often asked how and when Nazism and the Holocaust might have been stopped. And my answer may serve as a way of summarizing what I've said tonight. I think I know exactly when, and it's so early a date that the flip side of the answer is depressing. For the implication is that it could not have been stopped thereafter. When? April 1st, 1933. That was the day of the infamous boycott of Jewish-owned shops in Nazi Germany. But something else happened that day that was extremely revealing. And that was the occupation of the offices of the National Association of German Industry by Nazi stormtroopers, who said that they would not leave until this, this is the biggest umbrella organization of all of big business in Germany. They will not leave until that organization fired all of its Jewish employees and all the ones the Nazis regarded as politically unacceptable. The head of the National Association was no less a figure than Gustav Krupp von Bohlen und Halbach, that is the head of the Krupp armaments firm. He immediately this powerful man, he immediately got on the phone and rang up Adolf Hitler, the chancellor, and said, basically, call off your dogs. And Hitler replied, and again, I'm going to resort to another cliche, with crocodile tears. Hitler basically said on the other end of the phone, but I can't do that. These people have stuck with me through thick and thin ever since 1923 in the Beer Hall Putsch, and now they have every right to demand this as part of Germany's renewal and so forth. You will have to deal with them. Krupp had a board, a presidium, and he sent out telegrams to all the members of the presidium basically saying, what should I do? And one of them, a man named Georg von müller Gönenhausen, who was a textile magnate from a little city called Krefeld up along the, the Dutch border, Gönenhausen wrote back to him and said, you cannot give in. You cannot knuckle under. If you give in on this, you will never again have a moral leg to stand on in dealing with the government. Most of the other members of the board didn't bother to reply. They ducked. Some, some said no. Maybe you've got to be practical. You've got to be rational. Do what the Nazis want, so on and so forth. In any case, Cook took a day or two, and then he caved. He agreed to fire everybody. He got the Nazis out of his office as a result, and so on. And this is the moment when the game was up. Because only the insistence, then when Hitler's grasp on power was still weak, that the rule of law, in this case the labor contracts of his employees, had to be respected, would have slowed the Nazis. If Krupp wasn't willing to defend his co-workers, who would he defend? The question the Holocaust poses over and over is who will defend whom? If we, like Krupp, don't have an answer aside from myself, then the haters, once they get their hands on power, are unstoppable, at least from within. And the corporations become another instrument of oppression. Thank you very much. The myth arose 
proposed at the trial of the IG Farben directors after the war, the trial was 1947, 48. Um, the, the question was, uh, it is generally thought that IG Farben was the firm that was the maker of Cyclone B, the important firm behind it. And yet I had spoke of Degusa being the operator. Well, in fact, um, the trial in 1947-48 established the myth that IG Farben was the power behind Degesh, which was the company that held the patents that produced Cyclone. However, um, the product uh, the product was invented. Cyclone is a hydrocyanic acid. Hydrocyanic acid is usually present in chemistry in the liquid form. Okay? It has been used as a fumigant and a pesticide since the late 18th century. It is not a very easy substance to use for these purposes because if you transport liquid hydrocyanic acid, it tends to explode. What was achieved by a scientist in Frankfurt in 1920 is he figured out a way to soak the liquid in a substance, it was fossilized algae, so that you could then um, pack that algae in vacuum cans and carry it around from place to place. And then wherever you wanted to fumigate something, you would basically pop the cans open with the equivalent of an old beer can opener, you know, the kind of thing that my students don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> we used to call it a church key, okay? And all right, that's how you open the Zyklon cans. Now, the company that did this was bought by De Gusso in the early 1920s. In 1930, they made a deal with IG Farben, which made other kinds of insecticides, to create a common ownership. And the common ownership of that company, which is called Danish, was 42.5% of the stock was with De Gusso, 42.5% of the stock was with IG Farben, and the remainder was with a third company called Taylor Bolshevik. What the prosecutors in 1947-48 didn't know is the offices of Degesh, so the Zyklon firm, were in the Degusa headquarters building in Frankfurt. And the head of the company, a man named Gerhard Peters, was a Degusa employee who was still being paid by Degusa throughout that time. So in fact, and the directors of IG Farben, who were on representing that 42.5% of the stock, paid almost no attention to this little company. They were just trying to make sure that there would be no further developments in pesticides in Germany that they didn't have a hand in. So the active management was done by Degusa employees from Degusa's headquarters building. And it is Gerhard Peters, the head of Degesh, the Degusa employee, who meets with Kurt Gerstein, the SS man who procures, and Gerstein tells Peters what this substance is being used for. So, I don't want to theorize as to whether the prosecutors at Nuremberg in 47, 48 were just looking for something else to hang on IG Farben, but in fact, the real story is a little more complicated. It's the general theme of my remarks tonight. Everything is a little more complicated than it seems. Uh, you used to term slave labor and forced labor. Is there, was there a difference between the two, yes, and if so, what? There's a huge difference between the two. Um, forced labor refers to people who were rounded up in occupied countries and brought to Germany and made to work in, in, in German enterprises. They were usually not Jews, they were almost universally not Jews, and they were paid. They just weren't paid as much as Germans. They were kept segregated from the German population for the most part, in barracks and so on and so forth, but their conditions were not nearly so bad as those of slave laborers. Slave laborers were people from ghettos and camps. They were overwhelmingly, but not exclusively, Jews. And they were not paid, but they were paid for. Them. That's the difference. And there were uh, probably 13 million forced laborers is the best estimate we can produce that brought to Germany sometime between 1939 and 1945. There were probably, um, the, the figure for camp and ghetto inmates, slave laborers, is almost exactly 10% of that figure. Up until 1943, for the most part, concentration camp inmates were not used in German ministry because Hitler forbade their being brought back into Germany. And then they relented under the policy and they began bringing 
reintroduce that to produce injury in this way. the foreign organization of the Nazi party. And people who wanted to show what good Germans they were joined up. And then one of the first things they did, wherever they were, was try to hound Jews working for German companies, which they thought was incompatible with their national socialist convictions. So that's basically how they did it. And they write letters back home. They write back to the, their uh, other people in the Auslands organization back home. And they said, we're embarrassed here in Bogota that there was a Jew working for a German company, you have got to put pressure on those, those German executives to fire the Jew, and that's what happened. So it's a kind of, it's a denunciation from a distance. You will make their picture. Well, American companies don't play a very big role in backing these companies, that is, Ford has some shares uh, of IG Farben, but IG Farben stock is splintered, so it's, you know, it's 3%. Um, the, the issue, of course, that arises with regard to American corporations is there were American corporations that were active in Nazi Germany. Uh, Ford had a factory, which they had constructed in 1930 in the city of Cologne. GM owned a German uh, automaker called Opel. Um, and that it was based in Rüsselsheim, which is not far from Frankfurt. Um, the, all the major film studios were represented there. Um, IBM had a subsidiary, in, and so there were a lot of companies. So there were also a lot of Dutch companies with investments in Nazi Germany, a lot of Swedish companies, a lot of Swiss companies. And the punchline here is none of them behaved any differently from the German companies. They, they, the Swiss, when they came under pressure, if they wanted contracts with the government and so forth, and they came under pressure from the Nazis to fire their Jews, they fired their Jews. The only reason these companies don't get involved in slave labor is for the most part, they are not important producers for the war effort. And the slave labor was concentrated on military production. Not really. You know, the idea of um, divesting for political reasons was unheard of in the 1930s. I mean, seriously, no. And this is one of the things that we all live now in the post South Africa era, where we had this long argument in the United States about divestment from companies that were related to apartheid. And that, that argument took 15 years. Uh, but there was no argument like that in the 1930s. There was an argument about buying German goods and property and so forth. And there were arguments about uh, not doing things that would supply the Nazis with foreign exchange. So for instance, the Joint Distribution Committee did brilliantly imaginative things to figure out how, how to help Jews being persecuted in Germany without the Nazis getting dollars in the process of that help. Can you imagine? You know, this, was, this is the kind of thing that some people thought of. But the idea of divesting, and it was particularly difficult because in Nazi Germany, you couldn't repatriate profits. That is, if Ford sold the plant at Cologne and got, let's say, 10 million marks for it, the money had to stay in Germany. And that meant it had to be reinvested. And finding something morally superior to reinvest in him would be difficult. So for all these reasons, the executives decide, well, we'll play for time. We'll hang on to things as long as we can, hope that things change politically. And that's what they did. The, the, the one brave story about American industry in the Nazi Germany is Warner Brothers pictures. Warner Brothers in 1933 uh, saw uh, exactly, just sort of said, we don't want anything to do with these people anymore. They pulled their office out. They made no attempt for the rest of the 1930s to to place Warner Brothers pictures in German cinemas. Most of the other movie companies stayed and kept trying. But Warner Brothers was the one that, that showed some 
foresight and acting differently from all the rest. At the beginning of your talk, uh, you uh, uh, told us that a lot of this information came to light because of the uh, collective suits that were possible because of globalization. Uh, would you care to relate any of those cases? Well, there were two that came to judgment. They were both right across the river in uh, New Jersey. And um, one involved Siemens, and the other involved Dicosa. But in both those cases, the judges ruled, and, and this is interesting because the judges ruled after the companies had commissioned historians to go into their archives and read their records and so forth. If the courts had ruled earlier, I doubt I ever would have gotten into Dicosa's archive. But they ruled afterwards that this is a political question. This is the kind of thing that, that is restitution for slave laborers is an issue that has to be settled government to government, and it can't be adjudicated in American courts. So the short, what does that boil down to? In the two cases that came to judgment, the German companies won. Thank you. 